You made it to the end, the few, the proud. Congratulations. All right. You made it to the end of late on Friday, and you're still here. Such dedication. I love it. All right. I hope I will make this worth your time valuable. This, uh, my name is Damien Sinodinos. I'm a speaker. I'm with Ineffable Solutions. This talk is more than that. It's inspiring. It's motivating. It's also practical and pragmatic. So hopefully, I'll plant some seeds that will continue to blossom and grow. And I'll also give you some tools that you can go back and make immediate use of on Monday or tomorrow even. So thank you. Let's give it up for Anders and Anna one more time, please. What's that? What, what? Now? You want me to do that now? All right. So you, who was here at the end of yesterday? We had three teams competing to, uh, with projects, and we had some judges. Myself, Eddie, and James were judges. And uh, first we had the, uh, the tile that was integrated with the ring doorbell. Do you remember? So you could remotely trigger your doorbell. Okay, what we loved about that one was the, uh, the acted out user, scenar user scenarios, right? So one was you could trigger it remotely if you needed help somebody you know, come out and help you with the groceries. I know you trigger it in case you're getting mugged and dangerous. We loved that. What we were a little concerned about was the misuse. You know, you trigger it when you're getting mugged and your kids think you need help with the groceries and they come out. So we were a little, <laughs> little concerned with that. Um, the second one was man's best friend, some uh, little tiny robots, and they are able to play on their own, and you can feed them different cards, and they do all sorts of tricks like dance parties and playing bowling, and, and, and they really are like a, a replacement for man's best friend. If you have allergies, this is a perfect, perfect, we also, a perfect alternative. We also really like the uh, thought that they put into the test plan. And then the last one was the uh, virtual reality that uh, you integrated with your phone, and it also integrated with a uh, speaker, so you could listen and hear what the other people that were wearing the mask were doing. So we really liked that, thought it was exciting, but possibly dangerous if the children, you know, running around the room, not being able to see except for this virtual environment. And so for various reasons, we've decided to award the prize to, drum roll please. <laughs> Team two, man's best friend. Congratulations. So now you'll probably like this talk a little more than everyone else. <laughs> all right, so uh, thanks again for, uh, I do want to give it up for Anders and Anna and all the organizers and the volunteers. Let's give it up real quick because I think they throw a lot of a great conference. All right, so let's dive into this. Uh, this uh, uh, talk comes from a, a personal experience. It was part of the inspiration for this talk. So I'm going to start with that, uh, that story. Um, now I, I'm a professional speaker with Ineffable Solutions. This is what I've been doing for about five years. I started my company about three years ago. So this is, this is my job. I go around the world speaking on mostly core concepts, soft skills. Uh, but before that, I was a software tester. I started testing in 1993. At the age of 19, I dropped out of college. And I started testing in the QA department at CompuServe, a very old company, how you got online back in the early 90s. So for the next 25 years, I've been a software tester in some way, shape, or form. I've been in a lot of different roles, uh, from manager, individual contributor. I've used a lot of different tools and technologies. Much of my career, I spent doing automation, both functional and performance automation. Um, I've been in a lot of different size of organizations, from 30 people to 30,000 people. I've worked as a consultant with four different consultancies. I've worked as a full-time employee. I've done a lot of different methodologies and processes to build software, to test software, a lot of different techniques. I've got a lot of testing experience. but there's a few recruiters in Columbus that know me beyond just my resume. And so sometimes they offer me opportunities that are uh, outside of testing. And one such opportunity came up two years ago. A recruiter called me and said, Damien, we have an opportunity for you. Uh, it's with a commercial realty company. And they want, uh, they've recently merged with another company. So there's a clash of people and cultures and processes and technology. And there's chaos. And they really need a small team of people to come in and do some business process analysis. Look at how they, they run their business do some business process improvement, help make it better. And also write, do some business process documentation. I write down, document all the things that they do as part of their business. Are you interested? I said, yeah, throw my name in the hat. You know, We'll see wherever it goes. A few days later, the hiring manager called me. And he said, hey, Damien, uh, I've got a chance to look at your resume. I went to your website. I read some of your blog posts. I'm like, all right, good. He's done his due diligence. He's knowing, learning a little bit about me. And uh, he says, so I have a question and a concern. My concern is that uh, after reading your resume and looking at your website, it looks to me like you're just a tester. That's the correct response. Mm. He says, my question is, do you think that you can do this job? So that question kind of hung uncomfortably in the air for a moment. And in a moment of inspiration, this is how I answered. I said, well, what if I told you that 25 years ago I started learning, refining, honing certain skills, attributes, abilities, things like 
process analysis, looking at how processes work and figuring out the ins and outs. Process uh, improvement, looking at these same processes and saying, oh, this, is, this could be done better, looking for gaps and holes. Process documentation. I've been doing this for 25 years, getting better and better at writing down the way things work. But I've been doing all those things in a testing context. I've been doing test process analysis, test process improvement, test process documentation. So if I understand correctly, all you're really asking me to do is change the context of business. That's just details. So he laughed and hung up the phone. No, 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 no. <laughs> he liked that answer, thankfully, and I got the job. And it was a very small team of people. I thought I added a lot of value to the team. It was, the epilogue is it went very well. We analyzed the way they did business. We uh, offered some improvements. We documented it. This company had been in business for 40 years and never had a documented soup to nuts, A to Z uh, documentation of how they do business. So that's the uh, story. And that story I, mean, I told for a few reasons. Number one, it inspired this very talk more than that. But also, I'll be referring back to it several times. So. How am I going to uh, uh, go about today? I'm going to talk about unjusting yourself, the labels that we put on ourselves. What do they mean? And, uh, and what can they mean to ourselves and to others? I'm also going to talk about anxiety. How can labels cause anxiety and what can we do about it? And then I'm going to talk about rediscovering who you are, who you are right now, the as is, helping you figure out how to figure out who you are. Second, I'm going to talk about to be, who you might be in the future, your, your potential value. Now, if you look down, you might see some uh, labels on the table, hello, I'm. So everyone grab one of those, and I, I, there's uh, some markers under so I can pass out. You can uh, use the markers to fill out the labels. You can keep the markers. And what I want you to do is write your name on it, write your job title, and write your company. If you're between jobs, between companies, maybe write your last title, your last company. And I know that this information, much of it is on your, your name tag anyway that's hanging around your neck. But humor me and fill these out. So while you're filling that out, I'd like to get to know some of you. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm curious, how many locals do we have in the room? Anybody local from New York? A lot. Okay. Uh, sir? Hi. Oh, oh, you shouldn't have looked up. Now Now you've looked up and I've picked you out of the crowd. What's your name? Tom? Everyone say hello, Tom. Hello, Tom. Tom, you're from New York. Is that born and raised? New Jersey. Okay, so, so you work in New York. All right, you know something about New York, so you're, you're here enough that you know. Okay, it's the Big Apple. What is that? What does New York the Big Apple mean? So, okay. Does anyone know what Big Apple means with New York? No one? So they call New York the Big Apple, and we don't even know why. That doesn't tell me anything else about the city. Maybe they like fruit here. I'm not sure. It's called the uh, city that never sleeps. Was anyone out late the past couple days? You're finding this to be true, perhaps? So. If you've never been to New York and you don't know anything about New York, you've got the name New York, maybe you've heard that it's a big apple, which doesn't provide you much help. Maybe a city that never sleeps, a bunch of insomniacs. It doesn't tell you a whole lot about the city, perhaps. Who here is from uh, not New York, out of town? Hi, what's your name? Ben. Everyone say hello, Ben. Hello, ben. ben, where are you from? Seattle. My brother's in Seattle. Lovely. So tell me something interesting about, does Seattle have a nickname? The Emerald City, so it's Oz. Or green, okay, so it's a green, very lush city, is that it? Tell me something else interesting about Seattle, Ben. The Space Needle, the World's Fair, all right, so the Space Needle, that really tall thing? It's not that tall. Compared, it's taller than I am, and I'm 6'1", so. Okay. Ah, so make it a tourist draw, right? Okay. So now if you know nothing about New York, you know that there's apples, it's related apples somehow, and it never sleeps, and Seattle is very green and has this tall structure that's not actually that tall. But it's so, so you learn a little bit about cities just by the names of themselves, but not terribly much. Myself, I travel around the world, and I am from Columbus. Now, when I travel around the world, oftentimes I tell people I'm from Columbus, and they give me blank stares, so I have to add comma Ohio. And sometimes, comma, USA to, uh, to help out a little bit. So Columbus, does anyone know anything about Columbus? A little bit over there? Tell me something about first. What's your name? Arena. Everyone say, hello, Arena. What do you know about my hometown? You're correct. You do know something about Columbus. That's right. I wonder how much longer it'll be named after Columbus. We'll see. We'll see about that. 
So Columbus actually has some nicknames too. It's called Cap City because it's the capital city of Ohio. So that tells you a little something about it. It's called the Crossroads of Ohio because Interstate 70 and 71 crisscross right through Ohio. And so it's called the Crossroads of Ohio. It's called um, Arch City. A uh, hundred years ago, there's arches that went through one of the major thoroughfares of downtown Columbus, and they carried electricity up and down. That's how they got electricity on these arches, so it's called Arch City. So if you didn't know anything about Columbus, but you'd heard these nicknames, you might say, oh, it's the capital, and uh, it's where you know, some roads cross, and they have some arches there. Sometimes it's called Cowtown, which I think is more of an insult, really, than a, uh, than a nickname. But the names themselves don't tell you very much about the city. These labels themselves don't tell you much about Columbus, when Columbus actually has a lot of interesting things about it. Columbus is such a diverse population. It's called Test Market USA. A lot of uh, companies will test their products and services in Columbus because the way that it, uh, consumers respond to that product or service in Columbus is often how it will play in the rest of the United States. Columbus has more people, population size, than Cleveland and Cincinnati combined. It's the largest city in Ohio. It's the 15th largest city in the United States. Columbus is home to the Buckeyes. OH! Oh. The proper response to that is IO. <laughs> All right. The Buckeyes play at the Horseshoe, the Ohio Stadium, which is the third largest stadium in the United States, fourth largest in the world, holds 110,000 people for college football. Imagine that. Columbus has a world class zoo because of Jack Hanna, has a wonderful symphony. There's a lot of things about Columbus make it an interesting town. A lot of things you didn't know about, and you can't know about by knowing that it's the capital or arch city or test market USA. So Columbus, there's a lot of things about it that just the labels and names don't tell you. So Columbus is more than that. Well, what about what else? Here we are at the Test Leadership Congress. How many testers do we have in the crowd today? By a show of hands. Lots of you. All right, apparently you're at the correct, con uh, correct conference here. How many leaders? Would you label yourself a leader in some way, shape, or form? All right, a lot of hands, good. How many Congress people do we have? <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe they're using a different meaning of that word. But here we are at the Test Leadership Congress. And certainly, I've been here a day and a half, and I attended a lot of great sessions. There's a lot of content I've seen that's not ostensibly for testers or leaders. It's presented at a Test Leadership Congress uh, uh, conference, and it's presented to testers and leaders. But I had, uh, Irina, you had the wonderful talk earlier. Lena, sorry, right direction, wrong name. Lena, sorry, you had the wonderful personal journey, your story about how you got into QA. I really like that a lot. Now, that was about getting into QA, and you spoke to a lot of testers and leaders out here, but I also think that her story would resonate with people that aren't testers or leaders. Um, um, Jordan and Eddie, you had a session yesterday where you played a lot of games, including black, black stories. Those were two testers and four testers, but it could also be useful for people that aren't testers or leaders, right? There's a lot of content I've experienced uh, this week that is not necessarily for testers or leaders. So this label tells you a little bit about it, but it doesn't tell you all about it. So cities can be more than that. Conferences can be more than that. What else can be more than that? My name is Damien, and I'm a speaker from Ineffable Solutions. And I've already told you that. You know that. And I've also told you that I'm a tester as well. I told you I started testing in 1993. So I'm also a tester. I think that's a reasonable label. Did you know that I'm a conference organizer? In Columbus, Ohio, I help organize the uh, QA or the Highway Conference. It's in February. Um, so we're in our sixth year now. I'm also an improviser. I have over 12 years of comedic improv experience. Like whose line is it anyway? Performing on stage, something for nothing. I'm an actor. Being an improv uh, got me into acting. Some of the people in improv were local uh, playwrights, and they wrote some plays, and they cast me in it, so I'm an actor as well. Um, after acting in several plays, I wondered if I could do it myself. So I wrote a play. I'm a playwright. My play has been produced in New York and Pittsburgh and Columbus. I'm an artist. I've been drawing since I was a child. I drew all the slides today. Mostly I just draw for family and friends for fun. Uh, all of these things related to me being an author. I wrote a children's book that introduces children to the idea of improvisation. I'm a son. Any sons in here? Yeah. I'm a son, I'm also a brother. I have a, a, a younger brother that lives in Seattle. So uh, I'm a brother as well. I'm a husband. I got married 15 years ago. And um, okay, to be fair, I'm a divorcee. I think <laughs> did, not, did not go well. That was very short. But good news, I'm a husband again. I got married again and 
Things are much better now. So, yes, please, I am a husband. And now I'm a father. I'm a father to Alina, who is eight years old. Oh, she's such a cute little time sink. I'm a father again. Zachary just turned six years old. He's another love of my life. I'm a golfer. Any golfers in here? Loopers? All right, me too. I'm not very good at it. Maybe more accurate to say I'm a person that plays golf. I'm a rounder. Anyone ever heard that word? What does rounder mean? Poker player. I love playing poker for 20 years. I'm a gamer. I've been started on TRS-80 Color Computers where I learned basic and I started gaming a long time ago. I still game today. I'm confident. I'm feeling very confident right now. Yes. As well, I'm very nervous. So I, I'm hoping you're enjoying this. Uh, I hope this is going well. Uh, something that kind of describes someone that's confident and nervous, an ambivert. I'm neither extrovert or introvert. I often display characteristics of both. I'm curious. I think curiosity is an important aspect for being a tester. Curiosity is an important aspect for being a human. I'm passionate. Self-absorbed. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Anders. I am self-absorbed right now, perhaps. Sometimes you label yourself, and sometimes others label you in ways that you might not like. Now, <laughs> this silly demonstration is to show you that each and every one of these labels is absolutely accurate. It's true. I am all of these things. But more importantly, I'm all of these things together. If somebody recognizes me and says, oh, you're a poker player, you're a rounder, you're a brother, I am that, but that's not all that I am. So I, there's a parable that kind of speaks to this idea as well. The parable of the uh, blind men and the elephant. It's an old Indian parable, and if you're not familiar with it, yes? Oh, is it covering the mic? See, I'm, I'm unaware, apparently, too. All right, can you hear me again? All right. So uh, let me describe how this parable goes in case you're not familiar with it. There's this elephant, you see, and there's six blind guys, and they've never seen an elephant for obvious reasons, but they've never encountered an elephant. They don't even have the concept of what an elephant is. So one day, these six blind people, they first time encounter an elephant, and one of them touches the elephant's trunk, another touches the tail, one touches the side, one touches the leg, and they touch the elephant in various places. Afterwards, they get together, and they say, so what exactly is an elephant? And the first person to touch the trunk says, well, an elephant is very much like a snake, you see. And the person that touched the tail said, no, 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 you're wrong. An elephant is much like a rope. And another one that touched the ear said, an elephant is like a fan. And another touched the tusk said, no, 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 you're all wrong. An elephant is like a spear. An elephant is like a tree trunk. It's like a wall. Each one of them was absolutely correct, but none of them was holistically correct. They only saw a small part of the picture. Now, this is an old parable, but I have a more recent story that comes from personal experience again that kind of is along the same lines. As I said, I'm an artist, and I mostly do it for family and friends now. And my, uh, my young nephew came to me one day and said, hey, Uncle Damien, will you draw me a picture? And I said, of course, Peter, what would you like me to draw you? And he said, can you draw me a, uh, a robot, please? I said, yeah, Peter, I'll draw you a robot. And I got out my pen. He said, wait, 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 no, I've changed my mind. Actually, I want a pirate. Can you draw me a pirate? And I said, all right, Peter, I'll draw you a pirate. Said, all right, Peter. All right, so I started to draw the pig. He said, no, 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 actually, I do want the robot. Robots are cruel. No, actually, I want a pirate. No, actually, Uncle Damien, draw me the pig. No, I want a robot. I want a pirate. I want a pig. I want a robot. I want a pirate. I want a pig. And this is how young nephews do. They're very indecisive. So I said, Peter, stop. And this is what I drew it. <laughs> he loves the picture, as you do, right? <laughs> now, this is a silly story, but it also reminds me that when I look in the mirror, do I see a robot or a pirate or a pig, or do I see a robot pirate pig? Do I see myself as just a speaker, a tester, a father, a son, a golfer, or do I see myself as all of those things at once? It's a holistic picture that's important. So, somebody else that speaks to uh, this idea of, of looking at yourself in multiple different ways, labels, has something to say about labels. This is a guy named, whoop, there we go, Soren. Everyone say hello, Soren. You actually did that, all right. So this is Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, existentialist philosopher, and something he said with regards to labels is, once you label me, you negate me. I love this phrase. Now, he had something in mind when he said it, so this is my interpretation. What this means to me, once you label me, you negate me, means labels explicitly give what they implicitly take. Explicitly give means if you call me a tester, you're explicitly giving me something. You're attributing something to me. But you might also imply that I'm not a developer, or that I'm not a golfer, or that I'm not a leader. And that might not be true. It might be true, but it might not be true. It might imply things that are not necessarily true. So once you label me, you negate me. 
I love this phrase because it really brings home the idea that when I'm labeling others or they're labeling me, are they seeing me in a holistic view or are they seeing me in one particular way and implying other things about me that may or may not be true? There's one label I'd like to talk about that comes from my story. Remember when the hiring manager called me and said, Damien, you're just a mess. Just is a label. In fact, all words are labels. Every word I'm saying right now is a label. Each word is a representation of a much larger idea. This is why dictionaries exist. They're full of labels and the associated meaning. So words aren't, or labels aren't bad. They're not inherently bad. They can be used for good. You can be used for classification, categorization, for, for communication. Every word I'm saying is a label and I'm communicating with you. But they can also be used to stereotype, to limit, to restrict, dismiss. So there's nothing inherently wrong with labels, but they can be used for good and bad things. Let's talk about just. They did a study in 2011 of the Oxford English Corpus, all the two billion words in the English language, and they found out that just was the 57th most common word in the English language. 57th most common word. Why is that? Because it's a very versatile word. Just has a lot of different meanings. As an adjective, it might mean uh, something that's morally right, something that's good or fair. It was a just decision. As an adverb, it, it can be a modify, uh, as nearby. Where was the keynote? Oh, it was just over there. Uh, adjust can mean recently. When did you see the keynote? I just saw it. About precisely or exactly, the keynote was just what I needed. Wasn't it? <laughs> Quite, very, as emphasis. Did you like the keynote? It was just wonderful. Possibly, perhaps. Did you, is, is the keynote going to be good for you? It just might help. But there's another meaning of just. Only, simply, merely. Did you like the keynote? It's just okay. Now, that's the one I want to focus on. I hope you're not walking out of here saying that, by the way. That was the meaning of just when that manager said, you're just a tester. He didn't mean exactly, precisely, recently. He meant you're only, you're merely a tester. He was only seeing one part of me and categorizing me, pigeonholing me. You know what that did? That caused me anxiety. I wondered, is he right? Maybe I am just a tester. So let's talk about anxiety. How many people in here have ever felt afraid? Yes. Now, I'm not sure if I saw every hand go up, and I can only assume that those that didn't raise their hand were afraid. Yes. Uh, so, okay, to be fair, um, anxiety and fear, I'm using the words interchangeably, but there is a meaningful difference. Fear is about objective real threats, real danger. Where, on the other hand, anxiety has a couple different definitions. The first is worrying about something with an uncertain outcome. So where fear is about certainty, anxiety is about uncertainty. I think if I'm about to go on a uh, nature hike, I might tell my, uh, my wife, uh, I have anxiety because there might be a bear on the hike today. There also might not be a bear, but there might be a bear, and it's causing me anxiety. Now, if I take the hike and I come across a bear, then it's proper to feel fear because it's an objective, real, imminent threat. So there's a difference. Now, why is this interesting? Sometimes the uh, symptoms of fear and anxiety can be very similar. You start to sweat, and your palms get sticky, and your stomach gets tight, and your throat gets tight. So sometimes you feel like, oh, I'm afraid, and actually it's just anxiety. And what's interesting about this is when I started feeling anxiety from being told I'm just a tester, and I started learning more about it and looking up definitions, I realized, maybe he's wrong. Whenever I'm feeling anxiety, if I'm aware of it, I say, you know what? Maybe that bad thing is not going to happen at all. I don't know that there's a bear. There might not be a bear. And that helps me better deal with my own anxiety. So this is something that's worked for me. It might work for you as well. What's also interesting is another definition of anxiety. Desire, the first one is worrying about something. The second definition is desiring for something to happen or to do something. It seems almost paradoxical how you can worry about something while simultaneously desiring for that thing to happen. It seems weird, right? Oh, I'm, I'm afraid that there might be a bear, but also in a sense, it might be cool to see a bear. <laughs> so I'm not the first person to realize that there's this weird relationship between desire for something and worrying about something. Back to uh, Soren Kierkegaard again. He calls it the dizziness of uh, freedom. He says that uh, in Concept of Anxiety, 1844, he says the dizziness of freedom is a paralyzing possibility. It's looking into the boundlessness of your own existence. Jean-Paul Sartre, another existential philosopher, said, when you realize that you can and must label yourself, when you realize your true potential, it can have a dizzying effect. When you think about all the things that you are right now and all the things you can be, it can feel kind of dizzy. And this image is the uh, metaphor that they use. He talks about standing on the edge of a tall cliff or a building and that feeling of looking into the boundlessness of your existence and understanding 
you have the freedom to stand or to jump. It's a dizzying effect. And that's what you feel when you have anxiety. But just like you can jump, you can also choose to stay put. You have the freedom. It's about uncertainty. So this has helped me better deal with uncertainty. Now, it sounds kind of daunting. Uncertainty sounds like a scary thing. But Soren to the rescue again. He says, for those that understand uncertainty, that's not about things that are absolute to happen, that things that might happen. He says, anxiety becomes a serving spirit that against its will leads you where you wish to go. So sometimes when I start to get those sweaty palms and my throat gets tight and I say, oh boy, I'm feeling really scared. I say, wait, is it, is it fear or is it anxiety? I think it's anxiety because I don't know that this bad thing is going to happen. Maybe I should go towards that bad thing rather than flee from it. Maybe there's something fantastic in that direction and I should do that thing. Like take a job with a realty company doing business process analysis. So this has helped me better deal with anxiety, better recognize it and better deal with it. Understanding it's about uncertainty, it's that you can actually go towards that thing that's making you feel anxious. I'm not the first person to recognize the importance of facing your anxiety. This is Kent Beck, creator of Extreme Programming. He wrote a blog post recently called Publish Everything, parenthesis, pretty much. In that blog post, he says, the times I've avoided publishing, it has been because of fear of rejection or fear of judgment. He goes on to say, if I had listened to my fears, my, my readers would have missed out on an important message. Now, I would have preferred if he used the word anxiety rather than fear, because he didn't know that he would be rejected. He was anxious about being rejected. People might reject him, but they also might not reject him. They might judge him, and they might not judge him. So I think anxiety might be a more proper term, but the spirit of his statement is absolutely true. Don't listen to your fears. Don't listen to your anxiety, or at least be aware of them and sometimes go towards them. Now, some of you might be thinking, listen, Damien, I'm 22 years old. I've got plenty of time to figure out who I am. And some of you might be thinking, listen, Damien, I'm 52 years old. I know who I am already. I don't need to relabel myself. And I say, rubbish. This, this is a chart from Anna Vital. They make infographics. And this particular chart, too late to start, what they did is look at the biographies of the top 100 founders of Forbes' biggest companies list. And they looked at who they are and, more specifically, how old they were when they founded these very successful companies. Now, uh, for instance, Sam Walton was 44 years old when he founded uh, Walmart, one of the largest, most successful companies in the world, 44 years old. Now, the purpose of this particular chart was to show that there's societal expectations about when you can succeed. You have to be young, you have to be in your 20s. When you're past a certain age, you can't succeed. That's the purpose of this chart. They were trying to show it's never too late to start. But I think there's another thing that I take away from this. There's a good chance that when Sam Walton was thinking about founding Walmart, he might have been feeling anxiety. He might have had to relabel himself and think about who he is. He might have had to face that anxiety and go towards it. I mean, what if Sam Walton had said, it's too scary to start a big company like that, I'm not going to do it. We might not have had Walmart. Which might not have been that bad, I don't know. <laughs> so, so what? Who cares, Damien? This is the why. Who cares? So, unjust yourself. You're not just anything. You're more than that. Consider the labels that you put on yourself. Each one of them might be true and accurate, but all by itself, it might imply something that's not true. It explicitly gives while implicitly saying something of value. Use anxiety to your benefit. Go towards that thing that's making you feel nervous or anxious. There might be something fantastic at the end. And don't forget, it's never too late, but don't wait. Do this exercise today. Relabel yourself to figure out who you are and who you can be. Remember, you are more than that. Thank you. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm halfway. I'm sorry. That's the first half. OK. All right, so there's, there's more. Sorry. OK, so okay, so now what, Damien? Perhaps I've convinced you and you're on board that this whole idea of relabeling and reassessing who you are is important. So, so what can I do about it? As I said, this is inspirational, motivational. It's not intended to be instructional with step-by-step -step types of things. That said, I will offer some suggestions that have been useful to me, as I've done this to myself. And if your context is similar enough, that might be useful to you. So we already talked about unjusting yourself, labels, anxiety. We're going to just rediscover who you are right now, as is, and in the future, to be. Um, I'm going to, uh, there's a lot of different models if you wanted to perform this exercise and put these labels all over yourself, physically or metaphorically. There's a lot of different models that people have used to uh, label themselves. This is a model that I've come across and it was useful to me. So they've divided up who you are into three different uh, categories. The one is attributes. These are things that you are. You're curious, you're humble, you're passionate, you're funny, you're dependable. That's part of who you are. These are typically things that can be developed and learned, but it's very difficult to do that. If someone's not empathetic, it's hard to make an unempathetic person more empathetic. Not impossible, but more, more difficult. 
more difficult, especially when compared to knowledge. It's easier to learn things like, I know Jira, or I know how to juggle, or I know how to fix a car engine. So this is things that you know. And the final category is skills, things that you do. Now oftentimes a skill is just an application of some attribute or some knowledge. And really these categories don't really matter that much. It might be reasonable to say, I've read a book, I've read several books and I've watched videos and I have knowledge of how to juggle. I know where to put my hands and where to throw the ball, so I have that knowledge. And then it might say, I've taken that knowledge and I've practiced and I, I can juggle. It's something I can do, I can juggle. And then if someone sees me and says, Damien, what are you? And I put on another sticker and it says, I am a juggler. So does it really matter whether I classify juggling as knowledge, attribute, or skills? Not that much. But this model has helped me think through all the different attributes, knowledge, and skills that make me Damien. And so when I'm trying to label myself, I think, is, what attributes do I have that make me me? What things do I know that make me me? What things can I do that make me me? So here's a kind of word cloud type of thing. It's some different attributes, knowledge, and skills. Briefly look at this. And I want you to think about you and your professional job, whatever it may be. Think about if you use one or more of these things. I'd like you to stand up. Hooray! This is, this is what I wanted to see. Good. All right. So all of you use one or more of these different attributes, knowledge, and skills in your job. You can go ahead and sit down. Um, in the blue, hello, sir. What's your name? Igor. Everyone say, hello, Igor. Hello, Igor. Igor. Tell me, which one do you see up there that you use in your job, and tell me why? Honesty. What are you? What's your, what's your professional title? What do you do? Technical test analyst. How is honesty important to a technical test analyst? <laughs> Let's move on. No, Igor. Do you think it's important to be honest as a technical test analyst? OK. I, I think I agree with that. OK, excellent. Uh, let's see. Amy, you just gave a wonderful talk. Could you pick one of these? Uh, I saw you stand up. So uh, you, must, you must have one of these that applies to your job. Can you pick out one of these and tell me how it's important to your job? Cooperation. Why is cooperation important to what you do? Yes, unless you're a one-person team, right? We usually work with others, and cooperation is some skill that is, is, is a good thing to possess if you're working on teams. Absolutely. So I'm sure that it's very similar for the rest of you. You're looking at these different words, and you're thinking of ways that these are important to you and your job. Well, guess what I did? I went out to Google, and I Googled uh, absolute necessary skills, attributes, knowledge for the VA. And I found lots and lots of articles and blogs and opinion pieces. And there was lots and lots of suggestions of different things that, to make you a successful BA. You gotta be this, you gotta have this, you gotta know this. But some things floated to the top, things like critical thinking. You can't be a successful BA if you don't have critical thinking skills. You can't be a good BA if you're not empathetic to the customers that you might be dealing with. You can't be a good BA if you're not good with negotiation, give and take with requirements. Well, guess what else I did? I Googled absolute necessary attributes, knowledge, and skills of an architect. Same thing. Yeah, you can't be a good architect with em without empathy, without analysis, visual modeling, absolutely. Guess what? Same thing for plumber. <laughs> so if things go badly with your career right now, you have a fallback, okay? The point is, these are transferable skills. These are very abstract, general type of skills that can easily move from one context to another, whether you're a BA, a tester, a technical test analyst, a plumber, these are things that are probably important to making you succeed in that particular uh, uh, job. So this is uh, uh, the T-shaped model. It started in the 80s with McKinsey and Company. And they said, this is how we model people. Now to describe this model, the top bar there represents the breadth of someone's knowledge, all the different things that they know. And the vertical part of this T represents the, uh, some piece of knowledge, something that they know particularly well, their, their expertise. Well, this particular model is good. It helps me better visualize what a person looks like, but it's not great because most people are better or good at more than just one thing. So in 2012, Ashley Friedline expanded it and called it the pie-shaped person. He said, well, people still know a lot of different things, but they're good at two. A better, more robust model, but people in time started adding more and more bars, saying people are good at more than just one or two things. Now, 
this model right here is called by a lot of different terms. Uh, generalized specialist, some people call it, or specialized generalist. Johnny Factotum, a Renaissance person. There's a great TED talk from Emily Wapnick. She calls it a multi-potentialite. These are people that have multiple skills and talents and multiple things that they're good at. Now, you know what this reminds me of? This. A comb. Now, this, to me, is a much better metaphor for a person than a T or the, or the Greek letter pi. To me, this better represents the breadth and all the different things that people might know. But there's a problem. The metaphor is still broken. Why is it broken? Because no one is equally good at all these different things. I might be a good communicator, but not quite as empathetic. And I might know Jira really well, but not very good uh, coder. So you know what you have to do to fix this uh, metaphor? You break the comb. Now, each tooth in the comb represents some attribute, knowledge, or skill that you represent. And this is not mine. Why are you giggling, Anna? My broken comb? This is not mine. Jared Spool came up with this in, in Chicago in 2012, so this is his metaphor, but I really like it. Goodness sakes. It's been a long week, huh, Anna? <laughs> a lot of missing teeth. So what Jared Spool suggested is this is a much more robust, much stronger metaphor for what a person might look like than a T or a Pi. Each tooth represents some attribute, some knowledge, some skill that you possess, and the length of that tooth represents how good you are at it, how capable, how much you know. Maybe I really am a great communicator, but I'm not very, I don't know much about fixing engines. I'm even worse at Jira, but I'm really great at poker. These are all the different things, and guess what? Everyone's comb looks different. Everyone has different attributes, knowledge, and skills. Now, you know what else this metaphor is good for? Say you have to build a team. You've identified various attributes, knowledge, and skills. You said, these are the things that would, we need on this team to be successful. And so you find a group of people. You find Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and they all have their different combs. You say, well, Huey's very good at this thing, well, and so is Dewey, but uh, uh, Louie is not very good at it. If you start sliding these combs together, you can very quickly see where there's gaps and holes. All of a sudden, what, somebody is good at this attribute. Somebody has this knowledge. Somebody has this skill. This is something we've identified that's necessary for the team, but neither Huey, Dewey, or Louie has it. We need to train them or find someone that does have it if we've determined that that is something important. So this is a, another way to use this model that I found helpful. Moving on, this is somebody else has talked about how do you, what do you do if you figure out that you have a short tooth and you want to make it longer? Say, okay, I'm not very good at this thing. How can I get better at it? This is uh, Steve Jobs. Now, little known fact, founder of Apple. Well. Another little known fact, he went to Reed College briefly. In 2005, I think it was, he was doing a commencement address at Stanford, and he was telling the story of his brief experience at Reed College. And while he was at Reed College, he took a calligraphy course. So he learned how to draw these fancy fonts. And then he dropped out of Reed College, and many, many years later, he founded Apple and made the first, uh, made the first uh, Apple PC. Now, what's interesting about it in this commencement address, he said while he was designing the piece, uh, this Apple computer, he used his knowledge of calligraphy and built that into the computer. Apple was the very first home computer that had beautiful fonts, beautiful typesets. He used his knowledge from calligraphy of serif and sans serif fonts of kerning, and he built that into the computer, and it was really part of the success of the Apple computer. So he said in his commencement address, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. He never could have imagined that this calligraphy class at Reed College would have helped him found one of the most successful computer companies someday. Looking in hindsight, it was very clear to see, oh, that knowledge, attribute, or skill that I had, this calligraphy, actually did help me. Now, even though he suggests you can't connect them looking backwards, it doesn't hurt to try. If you think that there's some attribute, knowledge, or skill, and you wonder, oh, I wonder if this thing's important. Maybe you took some class in, in college, and you're like, how can that possibly help me? It probably can't help me. I'm going to try and demonstrate how it might help you with this. Old job, new job. I told you I'm an improviser. I'm going to do some improv, but I need three volunteers. I need two volunteers to be brave, clever, witty, fast, and the third to be a time. Can I get three volunteers to come up and help me? One in the back, all right. Come on up here, sir. Another? One right here in the front. A third one, all right. Ra round of applause for our volunteers. All right, your name? Aprajita, Ali, and Israel. Israel, Ali, and Aprajita. Give it up for them. Another round of applause. All right, who wants to be the timekeeper here? You got the easy job. That would help, unless you're very, very good at counting. Can you count to 30? All right. 
So here, here's how this game is going to work. Um, am I going to be playing with you, Ali, and Israel? All right. So we're going to play a game called Old Job, New Job. Step right over here. Are you expert improvisers? We'll find out. <laughs> So here's how it's going to go. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my new job as a tester. I just got this new job as a tester. I'm going to tell you about that job. And then I'm going to tell you about my old job. But play improv, you need suggestions. So what I need from you, audience, is to yell out some occupations, not shark diver. <laughs> she was in my improv class yesterday, and that was a tough one. So yell out some occupations. What, what should we make uh, our, our other improvisers up here? Oh my goodness. Fireman, I heard. Teacher, what? So what, what? A, a tank commander. Astro, oh, we'll go with, uh, we'll go with fireman and, and uh, a, a tank, tank commander. That sounds interesting, all right? Are either of you firemen or tank commanders? That, that's the correct answer. All right. You will be the fireman. You'll be the tank commander, okay? So I'm going to tell for 30 seconds, I'm going to tell everyone about my brand new job. And after that, I'd like you to speak for 30 seconds. So just wave at me when my time's up. And you're going to tell everyone about being a tank, uh, no, a firefighter, right? Just tell how it is to be, you know exactly how it is to be a firefighter. You tell everybody. And then back to me, and I'll talk again for 30 seconds. Then over here to Avi, you're going to talk about being a tank commander. And then back to me for 30 seconds, and the game's over. I'm going to be talking about being a tester. <laughs> my, new, my new job, OK? Because I'm talking about my new job, clearly. Yeah, so, okay, are you ready? Are you ready with the timer, 30 seconds? So, I, uh, my new job, I'm so excited about it, and I just started. And, you know, sometimes when I test, they give me requirements, and I push them off to the side. I don't care about that. Sometimes I just dive headfirst into the application, and I pretend that I'm a user. I say, okay, what would I do in this situation? I don't have, the users don't have requirements, so I'm just trying things. If I find something interesting, I write it down. And sometimes that's how I start testing without any requirements at all, just using my gut my experience to see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And sometimes that actually, in, uh, I find bugs that way that have nothing to do with requirements at all. Second step. Oh my God. So sometimes this is a very effective. And then I look at the requirements. It turns out that the things I was doing. Okay, so can you tell us about being a firefighter, please? Wow. Oh. <laughs> Say, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, I, it's not up here on a sticker, but I forgot to tell you about my old job. I was a firefighter as well. I, I didn't put the sticker on, but it's kind of funny because I never thought being a firefighter would uh, have an effect on testing. But as you said, sliding down the pole, it is a lot of fun. I remember. And you know what? Turns out testing's fun too. There's a lot of things in testing I do because they're fun. I like finding bugs. That's a fun thing. Going to those bachelorette parties, interacting with the customers. I get to interact with actual customers as a tester. And I remember seeing the joy on their face when I'm finding bugs before they find them. And they're so appreciative as me as a tester. And it turned out that a lot of things from firefighting actually were very similar to testing. You know, a lot of different ways that you fight fires. And say, oh, I'm sorry. Can, tell me about being a tank commander. Yeah. So, yeah, tank commander. I love tanks and time and the a hat and running around the house in a little boy car. So long road if you come in the house, I have a bunch of tanks and you know, <laughs> right? So maybe you don't have any work going on. <laughs> but um, when I was at work for the end game, who was receiving the tanks, I was head over there to enjoy it. And the third when Hulk came along, was there. So that was not a moment for me. <laughs> And of course, I was a tank commander, too. <laughs> that was another old job that I had. And I really didn't think that it would affect my testing. But as you said, you know, you're home. You loved tank commanding. There was tanks all over his house. You know what? I consider testing a lot like experimenting. And if you go to my house, I'm, I'm a lifelong experimenter. Even as a child, they give me a toy, and I poke and prod. And what does this do? And I, I really enjoy testing so much that I just surround myself with it. It's the joy of driving a tank that I brought over to testing. It's the joy of the job. So actually, it turned out that being a firefighter and being a tank commander taught me a lot about being a tester. So thank you very much. Give it up for your wonderful job. Great job. Thank you for keeping time. A ridiculous demonstration.
a real improv game that we uh, play on stage, old job, new job. But hopefully you get the idea that these transferable skills, these high-level things, whether you realize that calligraphy might or might not be relevant, you might not recognize that uh, uh, being a firefighter or being a tank commander could help you in your current situation or current context. All right, so I'd like to give you a pop culture example of this. This is Daniel LaRusso from what movie? Karate Kid, good. Now I'm looking out at the age of most people. Okay, we're not talking about this Karate Kid, not the next, and we're not talking about this Karate Kid, not the reboot, okay, the original Karate Kid, Daniel LaRusso. Now if you haven't seen the movie, um, I'll, I'll give you a very key scene. So Daniel, our hero in the movie, is being beat up by uh, bullies at school. He gets fed up and he's tired of it, so he goes to wise Mr. Miyagi. And he says, Mr. Miyagi, I keep getting beat up. Can you please teach me karate so I can defend myself? And Mr. Miyagi says, okay, come back tomorrow and we'll start your training. So Daniel shows up the next day, and Mr. Miyagi says, sand my deck. He gives him some sandpaper, and Daniel spells, spends the entire day on his hands and knees sanding this guy's deck. At the end of the day, he's sweaty and tired, and Mr. Miyagi says, all right, good first day of training, go home, come back tomorrow. And Daniel comes back the next day, and Mr. Miyagi says, all right, for day two of training, please paint my fence. Daniel spends the entire day painting this fence all the way around the property. He's exhausted and sweaty, and Mr. Miyagi says, come back tomorrow. Tomorrow, he sets him about waxing his cars. Wax on, wax off. All day, waxing dozens of cars that Mr. Miyagi has. And so at the end of day three, he goes to Mr. Miyagi, and he says, hey, man, I asked you to teach me karate, and all you're doing is having me do your house chores. This is, this is bogus. Mr. He says, I wanted you to teach me karate. And Mr. Miyagi says, I have been teaching you karate. And he says, what are you talking about? And he says, strike me. And this is the important scene. Mr. Miyagi goes to strike Daniel, and Daniel instinctively does the wax or the uh, painting move and blocks his punch. Turns out for those past three days, all of the movements of sanding the floor and waxing the car and painting the fence, those were the fundamental movements of karate. So in fact, he was learning something about karate, even though he didn't realize it. You might be learning things, you might have attributes, knowledge, and skill in your life right now that you don't even realize are applicable to other areas of your life. Or you might be offered the opportunity to learn something, and you say, why would I learn this? It's, it's very niche, it's very narrow. It might be applicable in ways that you can't even guess, like calligraphy helping you found a computer company. Now, this is uh, Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, depending on where you live. And he also recognizes the uh, importance of learning new skills. He talks about his time in college, and obviously he learned a lot from business school, but he also says, the, bo the more skills I put in my toolbox, the greater my chance of success. He says he learned a lot outside of class, socially, um, interacting with other students. He learned a lot just from living on campus. And as he learned and gained more tools, he put them into his tool belt, and he says that contributed to his, uh, his success. So think about all the different things that you do, things that you can learn from others, like Mr. Miyagi, things that you can learn from your environment, like Kevin O'Leary on campus. Think about those different knowledge, attributes, and skills. Increase your tool belt, because you never know how they might be useful. So what? So who cares, Damien? So identify who you are. Figure out who you are. Visualize it using one of these models, whether it's the T or the pie or the broken comb, perhaps. If that helps you visualize who you are and where you have small teeth and which teeth you can make bigger. Identify who you can be. You say, I have a small tooth in this area, and I want to get better at it. Connect the dots. Figure out what things you knew in the past that can help you in the future. Try and look forward and say, I think that this thing I know now, what might help me someday in the future? So I want to make that tooth longer. And how do you do that? You can connect dots from your own experience, or you can learn from, learn from yourself or learn from others. So hello, I'm. Now you have another label on the table. You've already written down your name, your, your uh, title, and your company. This time, I'd like you to grab another label and a pen. I like you to write an attribute, a knowledge, and a skill. And it cannot be work-related. It has nothing to do with your profession. Some people, when I've done this exercise in the past, have said it's a very difficult exercise. How many people read the abstract for this particular talk? Oh, so <laughs> pathetic. It starts out, what do you do? A very common question when you first meet someone at a networking event or perhaps a bad date. Very often times when you're meeting someone, that's the first question you ask, and we just talked about that. What do you do? And oftentimes, the answer, people, when they look in the mirror, that's who they see, their professional title, speaker, trainer, technical, test analyst. That's how a lot of people identify when they look in the mirror, by their professional title. I'm telling you, you're more than that. This is why I add you right down, attributes, knowledge, and skills, that are not about what you do, but who you are. More difficult, but more insightful. Maybe next time you meet someone, ask them who they are. Awkward? Absolutely. But I ask you, did you get any insight? I learned that Olay is a marksman. 
I did not know that before, and I would not have learned that if I just asked him what to do and learned about his, his professional interests. But by doing this exercise, I learned something very interesting. Anyone else here a marksman? No, but sometimes you make connections that you might not have made otherwise. Did anyone get, want to share any insight that you had doing this exercise or talking about it with others? I know, it's late on a Friday. All right, let's finish this up. Consider your labels. Consider the labels that you put on yourselves. Consider the labels that others put on you, like self-absorbed. You can't control that, but that's how others may explicitly see you. Bless you. They might see you in a certain way, and labels give while they implicitly take. Use anxiety. Recognize it's about uncertainty and simultaneously desiring something, and go towards that thing, because that bad thing might not happen, and it might turn out to be very, very successful and wonderful, like working and a small team to help make a realty company a little bit better. It's never too late, but don't wait. Do this exercise today, regardless of your age. I think it'll help you better understand who you are and who you can be. Identify who you are. Visualize it using one of these models, the broken comb. Um, identify who you can be. Connect the dots. Looking backwards is easier, but also look, try and look forward and say, I think that something about me right now might help me get this job in a way that I didn't realize before. And finally, learn from yourself and others. You already have lots of knowledge, attributes, and experience, and you can use those to make other shorter teeth in your comb longer. And learn from others, just like Daniel learned from Mr. Miyagi or Kevin O'Leary learned from others on campus. Learn from others. Unjust yourself. You are not just anything. Unjust yourself. Rediscover who you are. Remember, you're more than that. My name is Damien. I'm a speaker with Ineffable Speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.